Covenant Faith Institute. You can feel the atmosphere is pregnant tonight. The Spirit of God is here to meet us. So if you're here in person, if you're here on webcast, we welcome you to enter in as we worship the one who is holy, who is righteous, who is above every other God. So tonight, holy God, we choose to worship you. Holy Spirit, we welcome you that you help lead us as we offer our worship and praise unto you tonight.
As we worship Him and take our righteous stand And the Lord will rise with healing in His way To the God of restoration we now sing For the Lord will breathe new life into this land as we worship Him and take our righteous stand And the Lord will rise with healing in His wings To the God of restoration we now sing For the Lord, for the Lord will bring the light into this land As we worship Him Beautiful, 
angels bow before you, heaven and earth adore you. You are beautiful, beautiful. Angels bow before you, heaven and earth adore you. You are beautiful, beautiful. Angels bow before you.
Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts. Thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Better is one day in your courts. Better is one day in your house. Better is one day in your courts than thousands elsewhere. Than thousands elsewhere.
saw something like a sea of glass mingled with fire. And those who have victory over the beast, over his image, and over his mark, and over the number of his name, standing on the sea of glass, having harps of God, they, they sing the song of Moses, the servant of God, and the song of the Lamb, saying, Great and marvelous are your works, Lord God Almighty. Just and true are your ways, O King of the saints, who shall not fear you, O Lord, and glorify your name. For you alone are holy, for all nations shall come and worship before you. For your judgments have been manifested tonight, Father, with the nations, with the people, with the tribes and the tongues. We declare that you are holy, that you are holy, that you are holy. Son, who is triumphant, we honor you tonight. We bless you. thank you. We thank you for the depth of your love, the width, the breadth, the height, the depth, that there is nothing that can separate us from you. So Father, for each one that's here, each one of you that's joined us by webcast, we say that love is reaching out to you tonight. That love is encompassing you. It is surrounding you as you have chosen to worship, to honor the one who made you. 
the one who destined you for his greatness, for his glory. His love is surrounding you tonight. It is reaching to that deepest place in you. Even if you felt you had nothing to give, nothing that you could receive, that love is permeating you now. So Father, we thank you for your presence, for your love, that you're a holy God, that when you manifest your stuff, when you manifest yourself, your people are changed. So Lord, as a changed people, we set our eyes on you. We say our eyes are open, that our ears are able to hear your word tonight. So we ask that you would sow into us the depth and truth of your word. In the name of Jesus Christ, your son. Amen. Amen. Well, we want to thank you again tonight for joining us for Triumphant Faith Institute. You could feel that the Lord wanted to meet us in a different way tonight. That there was something he wanted to build into us. We're looking forward to Passover, celebrating Passover next week. We want to encourage all of you who haven't signed up for that to make that a part of your schedule for next week. For those of you joining us on webcast, that you find times, that you set aside times to invite people to join you, that we enter into corporately that time of passing over, that we're walking together as a triumphant reserve, a triumphant troop into the promises, the destiny that God has for us. So for tonight, we're excited that we're continuing our day. We start with 5.15. We had noon for the exhortation deliverance that Chuck shared on the key of faith. Then we had a time of breakthrough prayer here. But right now, I'd like you to ask you and join me in welcoming Robert Heidler, who's going to bring our final part to the Noah module as he begins to teach us in a new way. So Robert, Thank we you, welcome Ryan. you tonight. Amen. Amen. Whoa, this has been a good day. And it's not over yet. You know, I've really enjoyed teaching these Triumphant Faith Institute classes. It, it, I feel like it's just, I don't know, it's somehow different than what we do on Sunday morning, but it, it, it hits on a different level. And we're, so far we've been looking at the first 11 chapters of Genesis which really forms the foundation of everything else in the Bible. And so it's very important if we want to move forward in faith, if we want to really understand what God is doing in the earth, that we have a foundation in these chapters. And so we're, we're finishing up that section today. But uh, I think you'll see as we go into other areas, we're going to keep coming back to some of the things that we saw here in these chapters. I really want to welcome all of you on the webcast. And remember, next Wednesday at 7 o'clock, we will not be meeting because we're going into the Passover week. But uh, we'll be back the week after that with a new module. But for tonight, we're going to look at something I've never taught on before. And I've really enjoyed studying it because tonight we're going to look at the Noah module, part three, the aftermath of the flood or Nimrod's tower. So tonight we're going to see what Nimrod's tower is all about. Now last week we looked at the story of the flood. To set the stage for Nimrod's tower, we want to begin tonight by reviewing a little bit of what we saw last week. As we saw last week that Many scientists are actually beginning to take the flood story seriously. They found evidence that a massive comet struck the Indian Ocean around 3000 BC. The comet ripped through the atmosphere, plunged into the sea, instantly vaporizing billions of tons of seawater. Superheated steam birthed super hurricanes worldwide. And the impact created mega tsunami waves over 600 feet tall. 
One scientist put it this way, for about a week, material ejected into the atmosphere plunged the world into darkness. Up to 80% of the world's population may have perished, making it the most lethal event in history. And see, what the scientists are finding there really matches very closely the biblical account. That comet strike would have produced worldwide storms and a massive tsunami. As that worldwide super hurricane pours rain for 40 days and 40 nights, 600-foot waves race outward in all directions. And as those waves travel north, they're channeled between Arabia and India, and the water piles up higher and higher. And all of that water really only has one place to go, and that's through the Straits of Hormuz into the Persian Gulf. And as the water pours through the Straits of Hormuz, the Persian Gulf overflows its banks. But the area just north of the Persian Gulf is the Tigris-Euphrates Valley, and it's the most important place in the ancient world. It's called Mesopotamia, the Fertile Crescent, the Cradle of Civilization. It's a huge basin, 500 miles wide and more than 1,000 miles long. The empires of Babylon, Assyria, and Persia would one day be established there. And this was the biblical world in the first chapters of Genesis. A thousand years after the flood, Abraham would grow up here in the city of Ur. Noah probably lived near the city of Ur also. This is probably where the ark was built. But as the super hurricanes raged for 40 days and 40 nights, the rivers all overflowed. And then water pouring through the Straits of Hormuz moves up the valley. And the Tigris-Euphrates Valley quickly becomes a vast inland sea, more than 1,000 miles long and 500 miles wide. And everything living in that world is destroyed. But the ark is floating on the surface of the water. And the ark drifts slowly northward. At the northern end of the valley are the Armenian highlands, also known as the mountains of Ararat. And when the flood waters finally recede, the ark is left high and dry on the mountains. And so after the flood, as mankind multiplied over the course of about 300 years, they would have followed the rivers south, moved in eastward into the plains of Shinar. Shinar means the land of the two rivers. It's the fertile land between the Tigris and Euphrates. And that brings us up to Genesis 10 and 11. In Genesis chapter 10, we read this. It said, Now Cush became the father of Nimrod, and Nimrod became a tyrant on the earth. He oppressed and conquered in defiance of the Lord. Therefore, it's, it is said, like Nimrod, a conqueror set against the Lord. The beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And so in Genesis 11 it says, Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. And as they journeyed east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar. And they settled there. And they said to one another, Let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used brick for stone and tar for mortar. And they said, Let us build a city and a tower whose top shall reach into heaven. And let us make a name for ourselves. Otherwise we will be scattered over the face of the whole earth. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the men had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they had begun to do. Now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. So come, let us go down there and confuse their languages so they will not understand each other's speech. And so the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. And therefore its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. Now that is the story of Nimrod's tower. And the generations after the great flood, a united humanity speaking a single language migrated to the land of Shinar. 
And there the first great human empire was founded by a man called Nimrod. Now who was Nimrod? What was special about him? When you read some English translations, it sounds like Nimrod might have been a pretty good guy. The NIV, for example, translates his account this way. Cush was the father of Nimrod, who became a mighty warrior in the earth. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. That's why it is said, like Nimrod, a mighty hunter before the Lord. And the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. And so you read that and you think, well, he was a warrior. He was a mighty hunter before the Lord. He was a king. He sounds heroic. But there's a lot of reasons to think that Nimrod was not such a great guy. In fact, most commentators, both Jewish and Christian, believe Nimrod was a very bad guy. See, there's another way to translate these verses. The, ver the word translated warrior is the Hebrew word gibor. It can mean warrior, but it can also mean tyrant. The word hunter is the word sayid. And it comes from a word that means to chase. It means to track down, to capture and kill. It's used of hunting animals, but it also is used to describe violent predators who hunt and kill people. One commentator wrote, we will understand this remark better if we translate it instead of hunter, if we translate it plunderer or conqueror. Now many Bibles like the NIV say that Nimrod was a hunter before the Lord. He did his hunting in the face of the Lord. And that's misleading, because that is better translated in defiance of the Lord. And so most people who have studied these passages be believe that Nimrod was a violent oppressor. He was the prototype of a Hitler or a Stalin. Any who resisted him were hunted, hunted down and slaughtered. And so I paraphrase the passage this way. Nimrod became a tyrant on the earth. He oppressed and he conquered in defiance of the Lord. Therefore, it said, like Nimrod, a conqueror set against the Lord. Now, why is it important for us to know that? Well, it's because of what the next line says. The next line says, the beginning of his kingdom was Babel. So Nimrod was the founder of Babylon. That should let us know right there that Nimrod was probably not a good guy. In Genesis 11, when we read, let us build a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heaven. Let's make a name for ourselves. That was Nimrod speaking. Nimrod in Hebrew, is, Nimrod is really a Hebrew word that means the rebel. Many suspect that Nimrod is not this tyrant's real name. His real name was probably Etana. He was also known as Gilgamesh or Ninus. And around 2750 BC, a tyrant named Etana ruled over the region of Shinar. He's described this way. Having subdued his neighbors, he went forth against other tribes. And every new victory paved the way for another. He subdued all the peoples of the east. He became the king and the ruler of the whole world, a great builder who united the tribes of mankind and built a tower. But when Moses was writing the book of Genesis, he did not want to honor this tyrant by using his real name. So he just called him by what he is. He called him Nimrod, the rebel. The historian Josephus wrote that Nimrod led a rebellion against God building the tower as an act of defiance. The Aramaic Targum said, Nimrod became a man of sin, a murderer of the innocent, and a rebel before the Lord. Nimrod's city became the center of Baal worship and occult practices of every kind, including demon worship, child sacrifice, black magic, seances, witchcraft, ast astrology, and sorcery. It's interesting, the Freemasons claim that Nimrod was their founder and that he was the architect of Babylon. And so that brings us to Genesis 11 and the story of Nimrod's tower. After the flood, God commanded Noah and his family to spread out and to fill the earth. 
But instead, Noah's descendants con congregated in the valley of Mesopotamia. And they built a city and a tower. And their goal was to make a name for themselves and not spread out over the earth. And see, that was the sin of Babel. Now, what was so terrible about that? Well, see, God created Adam and Eve to dwell in his glory. He came and walked with them in the Garden of Eden, enjoying their fellowship. And so the Garden of Eden was really the first temple. It was a place where God could meet with Adam and Eve and where they could experience God and dwell in his glory. And God's original commission to Adam and Eve was to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth. God wanted mankind to take what he had established in Eden and spread it so the whole earth could be filled with his glory. Now after the fall, that original commission remained in effect. And so Noah and his descendants are again called to be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and multiply in it. But see, Nimrod had a different plan. He was puffed up with pride. He was overtaken by a desire to make a name for himself. And because of his desire for self-exaltation, he set out to consolidate the whole human race in one central city with himself as the ruler. And so Babel was a direct violation of God's primary command to the human race. The root sins of Babel were pride, self-exaltation, rebellion against God. And so God's judgment again fell on the human race. And it fell in an interesting way. He did not send another flood. Instead, God confused the languages of the people so they could no longer communicate intelligibly. You know, God is infinitely creative. The result is that they separated. They scattered across the earth. And so at Babel, in order to thwart Nimrod's rebellion... God cursed the human race with disunity. After Babel, humanity was no longer one people. It was many nations. Now some people ask, well, did Babel actually happen? And the answer is yes. And there's some interesting evidence for it. You know, you study linguistics, you find science teaches that languages evolved. They assumed that primitive humans communicated with grunts and gestures, and these became more and more complex until we developed the complex languages we speak today. Now, there's only one problem with that theory. It never happened. <laughs> there is not one example in recorded history of a language evolving to become more complex. In fact, just the opposite happens. Languages always simplify. Older languages tend to be complex. More modern languages tend to be very simple. Let's look at some examples of that. Ancient Indo-European was a very complex language. It had eight cases for nouns, had three genders. But Indo-European simplified into Latin. Latin had only six cases. And then Latin simplified into the Romance languages of today, like Italian and French. They have only two genders and no cases, no, de no, no declensions. The further along you go, the simpler it gets. Same is true with English. If you look at very old English, like Beowulf, back then English had three gr grammatical genders, five grammatical cases, Nouns were declined for cases, and adjectives declined for case and gender. gender. Wow, I'm glad I didn't have to take English back then. <laughs> Modern English is simple. It's almost primitive by comparison. And see, there's not one example of a language starting out simple and developing into something more complex. And so linguistic evidence suggests that the languages were given to the human race fully formed and very complex, and they have been devolving and simplifying ever since. So where did languages come from? I believe they had their origin at Babel. Now here's another question that Babel raises. If there was one original language before Babel, what was it? And I can't prove this, 
But I can tell you what the Jews believe. And they're probably right. Jews believe the original language spoken before Babel was Hebrew. According to Jewish tradition, Hebrew was the language of Eden. And that's what the Jews have always believed. They call Hebrew the holy language. One ancient Jewish writer put it this way, just as the Torah was given in Hebrew, so was the world created with Hebrew. When God said, let there be light, he was speaking Hebrew. And you know, there's actually some evidence to support that. Because you look at the stories in the first chapters of Genesis, and you read them in Hebrew, and they're filled with puns, with word plays that don't work in any other language. The names of Adam and Eve only have meaning in the Hebrew language. Professor Louis Fellman of Yeshiva University writes, Hebrew was indeed the original language spoken in the Garden of Eden and was the inspired language of the Bible. Evidence shows that it was the language spoken to Adam and Eve and will be spoken again in the kingdom. That's why I say learn all the Hebrew you can get. You'll have less to catch up on when you get to heaven. <laughs> and so at the Tower of Babel, God's judgment fell on Nimrod's rebellion. Human language was divided. And the result was that the work on the tower ceased. He didn't finish it. And the human race scattered and spread out across the earth. And so we wonder, whatever happened to Nimrod's tower? Well, you can actually trace what happened to it. It was eventually finished. This is what it actually looked like. Nebuchadnezzar, the king that took Judah into captivity, finished the tower about 600 B.C. He called it e Temenanki, the temple of the foundation of heaven and earth. It was also known as the great ziggurat of Babylon. And archaeologists have actually found an inscription near the base of the tower written by Nebuchadnezzar himself describing how he completed the tower. He described the tower as the most ancient monument of Babylon. And he said, a former king built it, but he did not complete it. And since a remote time, people had abandoned it without order expressing their words. Isn't that an interesting phrase? He says the tower was abandoned because they began to express their words without order. That sounds like confusion of languages. Nebuchadnezzar continues, Since that time, earthquakes and lightning had dispersed its sun-dried clay. The bricks of the casing had split. The earth of the interior had been scattered in heaps. But Marduk, the great god, excited my mind to repair this building. And I set my hand to finish it. And I have completed its magnificence with silver and gold and other metals, stone, enameled bricks, fir and pine. I have highly exalted its head with bricks covered with copper. And so when Nebuchadnezzar brought the people of Judah into Babylon as captives, the Tower of Babel had just been finished. When they walked into the city, the skyline was dominated by a huge step pyramid dedicated to the god Marduk. Nebuchadnezzar had told his architects to raise the top of the tower so that it might rival heaven. And it was an immense structure, as tall as a 30-story building, set in a courtyard a quarter of a mile square. The completed tower overlooked the city of Babylon for 125 years. But 125 years after Nebuchadnezzar, the tower was plundered by the Persian king Xerxes. He came in and ripped off the gold and the silver and the precious stones, anything of value. And then for 150 years, the tower fell into ruin. In 323 B.C., Alexander the Great planned to rebuild the tower and make Babylon his capital city. But by that time, the tower had so deteriorated, his engineers calculated it would take 10,000 men more than two months just to clear away the rubble. And Alexander died before he could begin the project. And this is what the Tower of Babel looks like today.
In the late 90s, Saddam Hussein developed a plan to rebuild the city of Babylon, to rebuild the tower. But he died before he could do it. Now, the story of Babylon has a message for our world today. Babylon was not just a city and a tower. Babylon is also a system. The spirit of Babylon is the same spirit that its founder had, Nimrod. It is pride, it is self-exaltation, it's independence from God. The spirit of Babylon says, we don't need God, we can do anything we want if we all work together. And see, Babylon has always been the symbol of a worldly system in rebellion to God. While Babylon as a city is in ruins, the system of Babylon is healthy and strong because Babylon is the operating system of the world today. See, the world still longs for Babylon. Here's something interesting I discovered in studying this. You know, the nations of Europe pride themselves on being secular. They want nothing to do with God. It's the spirit of Nimrod all over again. And to emphasize that, they designed the European Union Parliament building in Strasbourg to look like the Tower of Babel. And that similarity is not accidental. Here's the poster they put up at the construction site when they were building it. It shows the Tower of Babel with the construction cranes brought in to finish the work that God had stopped. The poster reads, Europe, many tongues, one voice. You see, the proud arrogance of Nimrod is alive and well in the world today. But as Nimrod discovered, God, God opposes the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. And see, one day the system of Babylon will be destroyed just as thoroughly as the city of Babylon was. In one of the last chapters of the Bible, in Revelation 18, verse 2, the angel shouts with a loud voice, Fallen! Fallen! Is Babylon the great? See, the theme of Babylon runs the whole way through the Bible. It starts in Genesis 10 and it ends in Revelation 18. But when the smoke of Babel clears, what Nimrod started will finally be brought down. Now, the story of Babylon also has a message for the church. Because Genesis 11 is one of the most crucial passages in the Bible about unity. In Genesis 11, God comes down to see what, the, what Nimrod and his cohorts were doing, and he makes an incredible statement. God says, behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language, and this is what they've begun to do. Now nothing which they propose to do will be impossible for them. God says there's power in unity. One people one language. They've started to do something. He says nothing will stop them. At Babel, God had to destroy their unity to prevent their evil plan from succeeding. And so at Babel, the curse of disunity came upon the human race. But God doesn't want it to stay that way. God had a plan to break that curse. And see, there's a passage in the New Testament that has some astonishing parallels to the story of Babel. It's the story of Pentecost. God said when the day of Pentecost came, they were all together in one place and they began to speak in new tongues. See, at both Pentecost and Babel, we find a group of people who had been commissioned to go out into all the earth. Both groups were all together in one place. Both had a common goal and a common purpose. And both suddenly began to speak in new tongues. But at Babel, the people were in rebellion against God. And the new tongues came as a curse to stop their work. But at Pentecost, the people were submitted to God. And the new tongues came as a blessing to empower their work. See, at Pentecost, God reversed the curse of Babel. Picture what happened at Babel. 
People working along suddenly began to speak in new tongues. They could not understand each other. They could no longer work together. The unity of humanity was destroyed. Then picture Pentecost. The disciples began to speak in new tongues. And there were people from many nations and tongues that were gathered there and they each heard them speaking in their own native language. And those who believed were brought together into a new humanity, the church. An ecclesia gathered out of every nation and tribe and tongue. And in the church, the Holy Spirit brought these diverse peoples together as one family, one new man. God had restored unity. Acts 2 began with Parthians and Medes and Elamites and res residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and Libya, Cretans and Arabs. But by the end of the chapter, God had drawn them all together in a unified body, sharing a common purpose, meeting together day by day, having all things in common, providing for all in need, devoting themselves to the apostles' teaching, to fellowship, to the breaking of bread, and to prayer. And then they went out into all the world. They spread out into the world from Jerusalem to, to Judea and Samaria and to the uttermost parts of the earth. And the curse of Babel was broken. And see, that is still what God wants for His church. Jesus prayed in John 17, Father, let them all be one. One people, one language. Of course, we need to understand what unity is. Because the church, a lot of times, has been sort of confused about how to get unity. About 30 years ago, a teaching became popular that said, unity will bring revival, so everybody decided to seek unity. Some thought unity meant fellowship. And so all over the country, you have groups of pastors getting together for coffee once a week with pastors of other denominations because they thought that meant they had unity. I drank lots of coffee with lots of pastors during, the, during those days. But what I saw was this. These pastors often didn't really like each other, and they usually didn't trust each other. But they thought if they met together for coffee, that meant, that meant they had unity and revival would come. But it didn't bring revival. And some thought unity meant praying together. And so there were big prayer meetings, some lasting for hours and hours, where evangelicals and charismatics came together and prayed. Let me tell you, it was dismal. They usually didn't like each other, and they really didn't trust each other. And the evangelicals would only agree to come if the charismatics promised to leave the Holy Spirit at home. But they thought if they all prayed together in the same room, that meant the church was in unity. Now I'll tell you, those meetings didn't bring revival either. See, unity is not a matter of having fellowship or all praying together in the same room. When God looked down and saw Nimrod and his cohorts building Babel, he saw that they had something that would give them unlimited power. And I'll tell you, they were not getting together for coffee. They weren't going to prayer meetings. What God saw in the people of Babel was a unity of vision and of purpose. They were united in a common goal and totally committed to moving it forward. And when God sees that, he knows there is a group of people with unlimited potential. See, that's what God is restoring to his church. He's giving us a new vision of what the church is supposed to be. The church is to be a new humanity where there is no black and white, no Jew or Gentile, no male or female. But God is drawing diverse groups together in apostolic unity as one new man. He wants to establish his presence in the earth. So men and women from every nation and tongue and people group can join together in one voice, forming a vast symphony of praise to Jesus. And when that happens, there's nothing that will be impossible. 
When that happens, the world will change. So how do we walk out this unity thing? How do we have unity? Well, the good news is the Bible tells us how. You read the New Testament. One key is to repent of anger and strife and jealousy and bitterness, quarrels, envy, self-exaltation. Galatians 5 calls those the works of the flesh. And so if you want unity, the first thing to do is to say, Lord, search me. Search my life. Show me if there's works of the flesh in operation. Say, Lord, do I operate in anger? Am I involved in strife? Am I motivated by jealousy? Am I in bitterness over how other people have treated me in the past? Am I quarrelsome? Am I envious? Is my motivation self-exaltation? And see, if God says, yeah, that's your issue, I have good news. You can repent. You can say, Lord, by your grace, deal with that in me now. And unity begins to happen. Then here's another one. Obey the command of Jesus. If you have something against your brother, don't run and tell all your friends what a bad person he is. Don't post it on the internet. God says go to him in private and get it resolved. And unity is preserved. See, unity is really not all that complicated. So ask God to pour out his spirit on our hearts, to bind us together in common apostolic vision so that God's kingdom and glory can be established in the earth. And see, that's what God is about in the world today. Let's stand up. And Father, we thank you that the curse of Babel has been reversed. Lord, we thank you that as Babel split up and splintered humanity, Lord, through your Holy Spirit, you're drawing nations and people groups together as one to operate in common apostolic vision, to move forward and see your kingdom established in the earth. Lord, we thank you for the days that we're living in. Lord, I thank you for each one here. Lord, I thank you for each one on the internet. Lord, that you would bring us together, move us forward. You deal with any works of the flesh. And Lord, bring us, pour out in our hearts through your Holy Spirit, a spirit of unity. Lord, we bless you and we honor you in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. You are dismissed.